<laughs> so if I could show you guys four clusters of very simple behaviors you could practice 15 minutes a day, and it would take you from being a good leader or a good person to a great leader or a great person. Would you be interested? Yes. yes. All right, let me see the show of hands. Okay, wait, hold them up, keep them up. All right, all, and anybody who has not raised their hand since lunchtime, would you raise your hand too? <laughs> We've got 100%. Uh -huh. All right, that's what we're going to talk about. Um, I've had a very interesting uh, journey, and I'm arriving in your place at a very late stage in life. And in fact, if I look around, I see some 30 year olds, I see some 40 year olds, which means me being 70 that I only just got to your beach that you've been at, you will be at for 30 or 40 years. Um, and I think maybe it was the route I took, which is um, uh, all logic. Uh, a lot of you got, got, got through with uh, spirit or, uh, or you, you through your heart. Uh, and I was relying solely on my brain and data collection and working with neuroscientists and, and all this before I finally uh, understood what, what all you guys were talking about. So it's kind of fun to be here. Um, though there is some trepidation, um, I deal, my clients are what I would call tough guys. And when I say guys, I mean tough guys, tough girls. Okay. So for example, um, U.S. Marshals. Talking about a scrappy group of people, dangerous jobs, um, and uh, of course we talk leadership talk all this stuff. Uh, I work with the, uh, the Senior Executive Service at the Department of Defense. That's the, their executive level uh, civilians, very tough-minded people. Um, I work with SOCOM, Special Operations people. Uh, and in fact, uh, we are working on some pilot programs down there, applying some of the stuff that, that I'll be talking about here. How do, you apply, how do you get people to behave differently, basically? what this one's all about, change. Um, so it was some trepidation that I accepted Bill's invite uh, because if I walked into SOCOM headquarters and I said, kumbaya, <laughs> what, what would happen? Um, I think I'd capture one or two, but, but uh, different audience. Um, so I prepped, I have prepped 30 days nonstop to come here and talk to you guys. Um, I have been growing this beard for 30 days, so I would, I would fit in and be one of you guys. So, um, All right, let's, let's uh, move out. And what are we going to talk about today? Um, I've been researching best and worst bosses for years. I've been l studying leadership for 50 years, uh, gathering data for over 20 years on behaviors and attributes of best bosses, worst bosses. It's very, uh, very illuminating. Uh, so we're going to talk about that right up front. Uh, I am going to ask you the old question about born or made. Uh, we'll see what we come up with there. Uh, and then I want to drill in. Uh, what happened to me is I, as I learned about attributes of great leaders, I found it wasn't helpful. Uh, the reason being is I could stand up in front of you and say, have integrity. And then I get off the stage, that's it. Well, there's one minor psychological difficulty with that, is we all think we have integrity, right? So, so Dave is sitting here thinking, boy, I hope Penny's listening to this. And <laughs> Penny's sitting here thinking, oh, I hope Dave is listening to this. Um, so it, it didn't get me very far. And that's why I started going into these behaviors. Then we'll talk briefly a little bit about human nature. Um, and I love the stuff you've done on Ma Maslow here. Um, and I'll give you some stuff that an old prof of mine uh, worked on Harvard Business School. And, and we'll do a little exercise, a little interactive exercise. Uh, and then I want to get into what blocks change, uh, both at the personal level, that's us trying to get better, and at the organizational level. And we'll, we'll just cover two things. There are a whole lot of barricades to get in our way, but those are that's basically it. Um, so to start, um, let's talk about best and worst bosses over here. How many of you have had a worst boss? Mark, put your hand up. 
life-changing experience. Uh, Mark and I had a, a worse boss, which is why I'm standing here today. Uh, he came close to destroying people, um, and um, uh, it was a, one of the worst times of my life. Uh, and so I became very, very interested in leadership selection, leadership training, uh, and so forth. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that, and then we'll, we'll also try to get the endorphins back up and talk about the best bosses. But for those of you that had a worse, give me some descriptors. What was, what was that like? Who, what were they like? Narcissistic. Narcissistic. Oh, wow. Narcissistic, demeaning. Authoritarian. Competitive. Competitive. <laughs> what, was the, what was that? Is that true, Mark? Would you agree with that? Um, Uh-oh, look at what I've done here. This is worst. Soul-sucking. Disengaged. All right, stop. This is enough. Come on. And the reason is we're going to drill ourselves into a hole. It actually changes brain chemistry, so we're not going to be able to lift off later. So we've got to stop it right here. Um, we could go on and on. I've collected a list of about 70 uh, bad boss attributes. The problem I have is that some of them are conflicting. There's no one bad boss that's got all 70. Uh, you could have somebody who's overly decisive, drives us crazy, or you could have a boss that's under decisive, mm -hmm. indecisive, mm -hmm. then that drives it. So you see what I mean? Um, so I went to the, all of the companies um, and worked closely with a lot of these companies that do leadership assessments. Like Gallup's got a division that does this, Talent Plus, Conexa, Shaker Consulting. Uh, there, there's a, a fair number of companies out there. Um, and I asked them, I said, what do, you, what do you do about this problem when you're assessing folks and you, you find these people at the bottom? They all look different. Is there any similarity in all the bad bosses? And do you know, and they, it's intensely competitive, they don't talk to each other. Uh, what would you guess the one thing that is true for everybody down at this end? What do you think? Puts himself first. Puts himself first, and that's close. We've talked about it all, this whole conference. Insincere. Defensive. Now, why would they be defensive and insecure? Fear. That's crazy tactic to take, right? Fear-based. Fear-based. Lack of self-awareness. Yeah. Is that interesting? Yeah. And what does that tell you about training and development? Impossible. Um, <laughs> having, having been in that business, uh, I could tell you the phone would ring in my office. And somebody says, you know, Fred is uh, acting up again. Uh, we had a, an employee resign. Uh, we're going to send Fred to the Leadership Academy. Can you fix Fred? No, you can't fix Fred. So, so it was that lack of self-awareness is the one universal. And what does that say for coaching? What does that say for 360s? All of these things, if you've got somebody who's deeply into now you can spend all your resources and, and work on Fred and forget everybody else and try to push Fred along. But um, Okay, now let's go to the best bosses. How many of you had best bosses? Somebody that's really, and if you work for Bill, get your hand up <laughs> here. Uh, okay, what, give me some examples, traits. They, they give you freedom. Freedom, freedom. wow. Freedom, space. You do feel like they jump tall buildings too, don't you? Don't take yourselves too seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, They're joyful. They're fun. They know how to play. Something. They trust. Inspiring. And what we're going to try to do here today, early on, talk about the behaviors. Is how do you how do you trust people? Let's get it. We're going to get it down to the molecular level. How do you inspire people? What's that all about? How do you influence people on that? So, what else? Inspi we all lead by example. 
by example, approachable. Yeah, it's interesting on uh, uh, on the curious thing that uh, when you go, when I go to see kind of, everybody's got different labels for different things in psychology, but when you go to the companies that do the assessments, which by the way, do you know who invented leadership assessments? Anybody ever heard of the OSS? Forerunner of the CIA, 1943, a bunch of Psychologist went to the General Donovan and they said, Chief, we're losing a lot of people when we parachute them in France for bad leadership, people having breakdowns. And, and we believe if we put our Jungian baggage at the door and our Freudian baggage at the door, we could come up with a way to assess people to predict future behaviors. It won't be perfect, it won't be perfect, but it'd be a lot better than what we got. So he said, go for it. And three weeks later, they were at the farm scratching it out. Three weeks later, they rented a place in Northern Virginia, an old estate, and ran the first OSS class through using assessments. A book was published in 1948 called Assessment of Men. Men was word for women and men at the time. <laughs> assessment, and they were, because there were a lot of women. Uh, so Assessment of Men, um, and it just blew the psychology world away. For about 10 years, it took to digest this. Because think about it, that was one of the biggest, biggest findings is that you can assess people and predict future behavior. Now, again, not perfect at all. and We, we can change, but we'll talk about that. So, um, finding a way to find out who, who are these people um, is extraordinarily important. Here's a question for you. I asked, uh, I asked Gallup and Talent Plus this question is, what percent of people would you call natural leaders? What would you guess? All the people they assess. 20 percent? Five. Turns out eight percent. Eight percent. And that, uh, one of my heroes is Colin Powell. Uh, that guy's a natural leader. You can go online and find a PowerPoint presentation on leadership he did. You can tell this guy was thinking about this for decades. This wasn't something he did, sat up and, and just put together. Um, all right, what else do we want to know? So what, what else about these best leaders kind of in general? Words we've used, we've talked about selflessness. We've talked about vulnerability, showing vulnerability. Do they show vulnerability? Yes. They sure do. Does that make them weaker? It's, it's crazy, it makes them stronger, doesn't it? Because they, we all know Everybody else is, has weaknesses. Of course, we don't. No, I don't. But you know where I'm going with that. So we know other people have weaknesses. So when somebody pretends that they don't, that can be very frightening. It certainly doesn't build trust. Um, so the, um, um, another uh, word that I heard here is these people let things flow through. Remember, we just talked about that. Uh, so very, very different group of people, and you get very, very different results uh, depending on who you hire and where you put them in these positions. All right. Um, so we go back to this first question, are leaders born or made? I'm going to have a show of hands, and I'll ask first how many say leaders are born? Raise their hands. How many of you think leaders are born? All right, one, two. How many say they're made? Okay. <laughs> I hate that when you, I didn't give you that choice. Did I give you the choice of both? Yeah, I, th I think it is both. Uh, had we grown up in the 1930s, which we didn't, we'd believe in the great man theory. We'd all say they were made. Um, if we grew up in the 70s and 80s, uh, relativism was sweeping in, and we really believed uh, the environment it was almost a, the great Soviet man theory, but the environment could, could uh, completely take somebody and alter them. Um, my wife, uh, during that period, wouldn't let my son have a water pistol. Um, he got to be 12, cried, wanted a BB gun. She wouldn't let him have it. So what did he do? 
It's just a warning story for all of you. He joined the Navy SEALs. <laughs> Thank goodness he's now a former Navy SEAL, so that's a very, very happy position to be in. But I noticed at the Leadership Academy that these people would take to leadership training like ducks to water yeah. and, and get even better. Uh, these people here, the great middle, you could pull them up like here with coaching, training, so forth. However, what about these, uh-oh, I've done it again. <laughs> Woo! I guess you could, you could do this. Did you guys see what I did? I've got them moving in the wrong direction. On the, um, you, you could do this, but, uh, but what, about this, what about this group here? So best or worst, are you telling me? This is now the worst. Yeah, all right, here, let's do another, another little round here. I've got polled 3,000 people on this. The, how many, again, had a worst boss? Raise your hand, because you get to vote. Only you get to vote. So we've got maybe 50 of you. Uh, how many saw that worst boss go to the Federal Executive Institute or Babson or Harvard or anywhere else for six months, a year, and when they got back, they went from here all the way over to the best, best boss. How many, let me see a show of hands. How many had their worst boss be transformed? And that's what I mean, that we're wasting developmental dollars if we did a poor job of selection <laughs> in the first place. And generally, poor training will get, you had one? It was me. Oh, <laughs> uh, you know. I, we have, we, you and I have talked, and I know you are a very self-aware person, so you were not in this category to begin with. No. Oh. Okay. Okay, so it's happened twice. Um, <laughs> um, once here, and the other uh, person that made it from worst to best, this fictional character, was uh, Scrooge in The Christmas Carol, right? <laughs> And that took three ghosts <laughs> to get him to, to head over in that direction. Um, but it is difficult to, to make and force training to do what selection has not done. Uh, so that, that covers that. Uh, so where I come out is leader in me, and I'm not asking you to agree with this, but think about it. I say leaders are born, leaders are made. And, but however, there is a group of people that probably shouldn't be leaders. Uh, they just don't have the aptitude, they don't have the EQ uh, to, to pull that off. And they, most of those people could be very productive in other positions, basically. So, I want to show you now um, the experiment I did. I worked on, I worked with uh, uh, 8,000 bosses collecting data from employees, rating their bosses. Now, I didn't keep names. I don't, don't have boss names, but I'd have employees rate their bosses. Then I'd ask for descriptors of the best and the worst. Um, and then as I didn't get really anywhere with just the descriptors, I went back and analyzed 200 best bosses. And what I would often get when you're questioning somebody about their best boss, they get very excited and they break into a story. So I collected t initially just 200 stories of best bosses, looked at the behaviors that were described, and put them in the fewest number of categories I could. And I came up with basically four categories plus, plus one. Um, and these are things that are so basic, it's embarrassing to stand up here and talk about them. Uh, but a lot of what uh, Raj and Martin talked about this morning you'll see reflected in these very simple, basic behaviors. Um, value others, we've been talking about that here. Giving, uh, being, these are, these are acts of kindness. Uh, involving others, inviting participation, uh, and connecting. Remember the discussion on listening this morning? The key way to have deep communications is start with listening. 
So the more I collected, uh, the more stories I compounded, and I kept coming up with these four buckets, uh, plus one, which is you've got to challenge people after you do this, because this gets them inspired. This inspires people, these four, these behaviors. But that's not the end goal of leadership. It's to get something done. It's to impl implement change. So then you have to politely nudge them. And if you get that reversed, you get in trouble. Uh, we had a, a director, John Deutsch, many, many years ago, came into CEA, CIA, wanted to change the world, and he immediately went here and got nothing but resistance until he left. Still, still viewed by employees as the, the worst director. Now, the value others, um, it's interesting. It's as simple as acknowledging people, uh, but it also included uh, show empathy. And the, um, the interesting thing is you don't often think of showing empathy with my crowd, uh, the, remember the SOCOM people and all of these folks, but, but yes, it's there. Um, so I'll tell you, let me just tell you a couple stories and you'll see what I mean. I've got a client in Abu Dhabi named Jossam, uh, very short guy, a project manager, very introvertish. Um, and his picture, his office is in a long hallway and there's a, a, like a counter in front of his office that goes up and down. So he's every morning stands in, at the counter in his white robes, Arab robes, and he's got his tea and says hello to people as they come and go. Um, I didn't tell you what his project was. His project was to launch the first Arab satellite, and he did it. So what does that make Jossam in the Arab world? He's a hero. And what do you do with heroes? You give them a bigger office, and you put them in the corner. So he had banks of windows on both sides. Uh, his introvertism took over. He would be working at his computer all day doing email, and the um, um, interesting thing is after about two months, his chief of HR went into him, said, sir, I, there's something I've got to raise with you. Um, uh, there's an issue. And he said, well, what is it? He said, um, the, the employees think you're mad at them. <laughs> uh, and he said, what? She said, they think you're mad at them because you don't talk to them anymore. Now, I wouldn't even tell you that story except that that story came out over and over again. So somehow it's very important for us humans with a position, a person of a position of authority to say hello to us, to check in. So we know they're not angry at us. To know. Isn't that interesting? Very small thing. I mean, how long does it take the boss to say hello? How are you doing this morning? Stop by somebody's desk on the way in. Small acts, but they mean a whole lot. And that's probably the theme of this whole talk is it's the little things that matter. Little things that matter. If I had my life to live over, I wouldn't change a thing in terms of some of the crazy things that, that, that I've done or been involved in. However, I would change my small actions with my wife, my family, friends. I keep thinking, rerunning the tapes. The difference between me and you is when I take the, person, uh, the test, personality, or uh, any kind of attribute test, um, I score in the lower half of the empathy scale. Um, you guys, I bet, universally, are in the upper 50%, which helped you with your voyage to get here, frankly. Um, so I've been working on that, trying to improve myself, and it's, it's tough. It's tough. Um, I'll tell you about my marriage in a minute, that, uh, <laughs> how that... How, that, how that's been working. Uh, but that's the, uh, uh, she, uh, I'm, I'll tell you now, gosh. Um, who's heard of John Gottman? Okay, marriage guy, uh, started in the 70s because he was worried about the divorce rates and so forth. And he's, his, uh, one of his labs is actually a house with its, uh, you think the CIA did, it. it's got video and audio all through it. And what they do is watch couples through the day, how they interact. So what he's come up with is interesting. Uh, we have countless little interactions every day, and um, he calls them bids. So let me give you an example. I'm reading the newspaper. 
uh, lacking empathy. <laughs> and uh, my wife is sitting across from me, and she is looking at the internet, and she said, uh, we've got a um, new Thai restaurant in town. That was a bid. Now, what do I do with the bid? Uh, I could say, I'm reading. That's a bid rejection. <laughs> or I could say, with phenomenal inner strength, pull myself off my newspaper and, and say, oh, we ought to try it. That would be an answering the bid, right? Another example, I'm in the kitchen with my wife, and she, um, uh, I look out the window and I say, oh, there's a, there's a bluebird in, in the yard. That's a bid. Now, how does she answer? Well, she'll, my wife would, step over, look out, and say, oh, he's a fat one, isn't he? That's an answer to the bid. Or she could ignore me. Well, what really scared me was the statistics. Where couples answer 80% of those bids, probability of divorce over the next five years is nil. I mean, close to nil. In couples that have 80% bid rejections, divorce is almost certain within five years. That scared me about myself more than anything I've ever done, and the reason is I'm the 80% bid rejector. She's the 90% bid answer. Um, and so our marriage of 44 years, I'm convinced, is held together because of this woman. Now, I'm still weak because I haven't told her about this study. <laughs> uh, and the reason is she's going to start counting and have the realization of why did I marry this toad? But it, but, um, so this is what a lack of empathy will do for you. Uh, but that's the value of others. Um, it's both acknowledging people and or showing empathy, right? Now this one's an interesting give. What could you give to fellow employees in the workplace? What kind of gifts could you give people? Your attention. Not acknowledgement, big deal. Appreciation. Appreciation, super powerful. Opportunities. Opportunities is an incredible, incredible gift you can give to people if you're in a leadership position. Validation. Validation. I mean, you guys get it. You guys, yes, ma'am. Yes, absolutely. It's, these are non-monetary gifts. They're not even donuts and bagels. They're, they're just simple acts of kindness. Uh, and this came out over and over again. Now, what is this? This hinges on the law of reciprocity in psychology. It's the basis for trust, trust building. It also hinges on, in anthropology, law of reciprocity applies to groups of people as well. And it's not the fact you gave somebody the gift. It's the fact that you do that in the regular course, uh, and you're showing consistency. Therefore, I can trust you. I can trust you. The next one is uh, getting other people involved, um, inviting participation. You know that we all crave a piece of the pie. You do and I do. So being able to invite people into planning uh, where you can, you can't always do that, or decision making is extraordinarily important. The, um, where I learned my lesson on this uh, was in Vietnam. Um, and I uh, was a platoon leader and uh, we used to always require my guys to fill sandbags there every day so that we could build hooches at night in case there was a rocket attack or mortar attack. And uh, I can remember one morning I had a headache, I didn't feel good, and we're driving in a, in a two and a half ton truck, I'm in the passenger seat, uh, the sun's coming off the South China Sea and hitting my eyes, making the headache worse little mud on the windshield, and I'm thinking to myself, this is one of these terrible, awful leadership moments where everybody's going to be unhappy. I'm going to have to split the squad in two. Half of them are going to be filling sandbags, complaining because they have to do all the work, and then the other half of the guys have to perform guard duty, and they're going to complain because they have to lie down in the hot sand, got sand fleas out there, uh, and I'm just thinking, this is... This is miserable. The truck stops. Spec 4 Johnson jumps out the back and is walking around the truck. And I, just because I felt ornery, I said, Johnson, what do we do here? And he looks at me and says, that's easy, sir. 
split them into three groups. I said, okay. He said, the first group, sir, um, put them on perimeter duty, but make sure you put two guys on that sandy knoll over there because one guy can't see off both sides. I thought, okay, starting to get impressed with Specfor Johnson. And then he said, in the second group, fill sandbags, and the third group goes swimming. I never thought of that. And then he paused and he said, then, sir, we rotate. And thank you, Specfor Johnson, for my single best day in Vietnam. I still remember swimming with the guys and getting the mission done, both, because I inadvertently listened to a good idea. And we all know that. I'm preaching to the choir on this, but getting others involved, the, the problem you have uh, right now is uh, I work with global uh, executives uh, and literally everywhere. I was with Spanish executives this, earlier this week. Everywhere I go, uh, people's day is clogged with meetings and email. About 70% is sort of my feel in talking with people. That gives you 30% of the day to do your real job and practice these types of behaviors. And that's not a lot. So how can you speed that up? Well, there's a great website here on the Involve, uh, liberatingstructures.org. Anybody know that? How many, how many know that? Great. Uh, make sure you tie into that thing, because what you can do, like, you know, the one, two, four, all? Yep. Uh, you can take a group, uh, and in 40 minutes, you can take a group this large in 40 minutes, and have full agreement on ways to improve things uh, or uh, agreeing on values, core values. Whereas it would take you three days of a normal offsite with deadly PowerPoint and, and you still wouldn't get there. So you agree? Absolutely. Good, 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 good. Um, the next one is the connect, uh, deeper communications. And again, that's listening. Um, it's everything but email and websites. So face-to-face -face conversations, hallway conversations, all that good stuff. Um, absolutely vital. We need it because we're, we are people. I once, um, I once had uh, the spy masters, we call it the DDO, uh, call me up to his office. His secretary called me and said, get up here right away. I thought, whoa, what's going on? So I, I ran up. Um, and as I was stepping across the threshold, he was looking at his desk reading stuff, and he looked up and he said to me, Mike, why is it when I pull the levers, nothing happens? He's mm -hmm. one of the most powerful people in the world. Uh, wonders why the levers don't work. You know, the levers, of course, is standard stuff we do. We've got the formal recognition system. Uh, you know, we've got the... Uh, the structure of the organization, all that good formal stuff. Um, and the great thing about that question was that was a way, questions are a great way for deeper communications. I've been thinking about that question every day since, it's over 20 years. And that's what I work on. Is why is it? What can we do to make the levers work in organizations? So don't, this is not brand of Uncle Mike. This is exactly the same as e EQEI, which I love. Uh, I mean, this stuff overlaps. We're, we're all 90% there, really in knowing what, what great leadership is. The nudge uh, is very, very simple. Um, it involves, once you've inspired somebody, uh, valuing others, build safety. That's your first step. Building trust, second step. Uh, starting to get others to have insights. And that's a key duty of the leader. The reason is if you tell them, they won't do it. But if you can get them to think about an issue or they get involved in issues uh, or you ask questions, this is how you build insight. And we all know insight, you know, that the alpha waves go to gamma in the brain and there's explosion of energy and you've got this instantaneous uh, connections and neurons. We don't know why and it releases a good feeling. Well, believe it or not, that's an antidote for change resistance. 
an antidote for change resistance. So, so you can use these two for that. So you got to do all four, and now you're finally ready to push, challenge, give them the nudge. A good example of giving somebody a warning so you don't embarrass them, uh, requiring them to think, making them think, and then they act, was um, uh, Admiral Clark, when he was uh, uh, the chief of naval operations, used to hand out leadership books to his direct reports. Well, that's a good move. That's a symboli symbolic move. Um, but what percent of them would read those, do you think? Five, ten, maybe? When he handed them a book, he'd say, next time I see you, I'm going to ask you what you thought of this book. <laughs> Didn't hurt anybody's feelings. Did they read the book? You bet they read the book. So it's just, it's, it's little tricks like that that we won't, we're not going to go into detail on, but I did want to uh, show you that. So that's what I got from really great leaders. The behaviors are all stunningly simple, and that's, of course, going to raise the next issue of if they're so simple, why don't we all do them? And we'll go there after we talk about the worst boss behaviors. Um, I want to show you a show you something I saw at UCLA, uh, Amundsen Brain Mapping Center. They work on something, and I know some of you are familiar with social pain. So strong negative emotions. Their view of Maslow is, you know, maybe that survival thing. Maybe there's something even more powerful under that, which is this this hunger for social connection and and so forth. And they're doing a lot of uh, MRI work to, to take a look at that. But I, what I saw was a, um, an experiment, and, and it was the uh, first one I saw was a woman in an MRI machine, doesn't matter. Um, and you had, she's looking at a cartoon on a screen. She's in the MRI. And what's happening is these three characters are throwing a ball. on that screen. She has a lever because this is her character. She has a lever that when she gets the balls, pushes the lever, throws it up here. Interesting, huh? And then the other one throws one around and comes back. So Matthew Lieberman is a doctor that works on this. And then after some period of time, what he does was he flips a, uh, flips a switch. All it does, it changes the cartoon. She doesn't know that. But what happens is these two cut her out. What do you think happens to her brain? Turns off. Prefrontal cortex goes dark. There is no lot. You remember system one, system two, Kahneman, all that? The, the uh, thinking part of the brain shuts down, and all that emotional, not good emotion, all that bad emotional stuff flares up. And different people describe it differently. She described it as, uh, uh, as being jealous that these two cut her out. Other people would say anger. But they're all experiencing a strong, strong negative feeling. This is what I find really scary and fascinating. First off, it follows the same path as physical pain through the brain. Uh, it goes to all the places physical pain goes. However, it doesn't go send messages down to the wrist that's broken, because the wrist isn't broken, it stays there. Uh, number two, it is held in memory longer and more intensely than physical pain. Isn't that remarkable? Um, now what causes it? Uh, a lot of things that we've talked about here. Unfairness. You perceive unfairness from a boss, bingo. Uh, another one is assault on your status or your standing, um, your relationships with, with others. Um, and another one is lack of control. If you lose control, it just troubles us no end. Now I'm simplifying. The, they've got actually five categories. But that's, that's basically what they came up with. Uh, so let's take a look. This is a busy slide, but go ahead and read this.
Now let's test that held in memory longer and more intensely thing. Do you guys remember when you're in high school and you got sprained your ankle playing soccer? Try to think that through, that hurt. But you can't quite, you don't feel that pain, right? But now think of old Mary Lou who betrayed you. <laughs> Conjure that one back up. Doesn't, aren't you, you still feel that, don't you? Um, so that's what this stuff's all about. And that's why it's absolutely crucial on any human relationships. It's crucial, certainly, in organizations. And we tend to overlook it because if we have lots of these bad bosses, they're busy doing this stuff all day long. They're busy doing this stuff all day long. So you're losing phenomenal productive capacity of your employees as a result of that. So that's it. We've talked about best boss behaviors, all very simple. I gave you a little blue handout uh, that describes some of the things you can do during the day. I'm, I'm working, like I say, I'm working with SOCOM right now, and they're actually requiring managers to actually practice this stuff 15 minutes a day until they develop habits. That's a, we'll see how that's a big one that gets in the way. Um, so we talked about the best. We know this is the worst because they're doing things, usually inadvertently, uh, but things that really cause our prefrontal cortex to, to shut down. So now let's move on to human nature, talk a little bit about that um, and how that applies on leadership and so forth. And what I'm going to do, because this is the last day, Friday afternoon after lunch, <laughs> to make you guys do this work. So Danny, I want you to get a crew of maybe seven, eight people and come up here and draw, when I call you, draw a profile of a head and start filling in what's in people's heads. And over here, who are going to pick? Ah, oh, you guys. You'll pick your squad. You come up and do the same thing on this one. And the rest of you are wondering, well, I'm just going to be sitting here while they're doing that. Left you're left out, but no, you're not. <laughs> We're going to stand up and stretch while you guys come up and start. There's a timed event. We're going to see who is. This is an intense competition. About six or eight of you, come on up and, and draw the profile and then start filling in. Okay, you guys start. Who's going to report out? You're reporting out. Oh, you guys. Oh, you don't sit down. No. No. All right, you guys go ahead. I'm going to ask. Uh, the blue birds are going to report out first, then we'll get the red birds to report out. So what's in other people's heads? Well, we were all over the map. I think we, we started with questions. Mm -hmm. We went to sleepiness, and we have love drawn in. We have a massive myelinated, perhaps improperly, neuron connecting all of it. We have a tryptamine, a phenylethamine, and a monooxidase. I forgot where it was. Oxidase I inhibitor. Where I was. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. And those are facilitating daydreams. And, oh, and wet dreams. Somebody got that. <laughs> <laughs> and actualization of fantasies and contemplation of death and fear. Ooh. But there is the heart and, oh, and rivulets of excitement, exclamation points, mm -hmm. connecting it all. So Love that, and the third eye. The so that's, that's sex. Yeah. Right? yeah. I thought that was just me. <laughs> okay. Um, and we're coming back. Don't, don't sit down. You guys come on up. Tell us what you got. Well, um, we went for a simplified version. So we went sort of for the prefrontal lobe. We went for the reptilian brain and the limbic brain. And so basically everyone just kept saying sex. So... <laughs> <laughs>
sort of this, this other system. Oh, sorry. So then there's the pain reflex, which is the system within it that is trying to evaluate what this has to do with sex, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're going to get any or not. Um, which then it goes up in here, like, well, and you're judging and you're, you're you kind of trust, integrity, you know, ethics. Is this the right kind of sex to have? Um, and then <laughs> the fear, survival, the threat, the disgust, I don't want to sleep with you. Um, and that was kind of the, the orientation, at least what I heard from our group kept coming back to uh, in terms of how we, right, we structured stay, stay up mind. here, so we've got a new base for the Maslow's triangle. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I see this. All right, this is what's interesting, uh, because I, I, I just did this with a group of Austrians who are obviously very different than we are, but they came up with pretty much this, this same stuff, right? Pretty much. So it's universal that we have ideas in our head. We've got notions. We've got biases. We've got uh, ideas. All this stuff in our head. Now here's the question. This is, this is your person, mm -hmm. and that's a different person over there. Mm -hmm. So let me ask, is their joy mm -hmm. the same as their joy? Oh. No, because their joy is outside of the head. Right. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> you, is it embodied? <laughs> Dave, I was hoping so much more from you. I really was. Okay. <laughs> Uh, you know what's interesting? When we were born, uh, our brains were totally different from each other, more than fingerprints. The connections, the uh, pre-programmed rates of development of which region of the brain, totally different. Um, and that's where we get into some of that trait stuff. However, uh, then you had a very different upbringing. Than I did. You had different parents than I did. You had different teachers. You had different experiences along the way, went to different colleges. Um, and so now that gets banked on top. That's the nature-nurture argument, back to that. Um, and so that means that everything in that head, like ideas and notions and fears and paranoias, is different than that head, isn't it? So what does that mean for anything? What about self-assurance, self-knowledge? What do you think? Each one's unique. Each one's unique. What's, what's, is the reality here in this head different than the reality in that head? Yeah. So what is reality? Uh, no, no, we're not going to go there. <laughs> right? What about misperceptions? Are they, is this a cause of misperceptions? Mm -hmm. I contend most of the uh, issues in marriages are really, I mean, some are gender communication based, but I contend most of it's two separate brains. Right? Uh, so what if I, let's say that's you and that's your spouse, uh, I'm going to solve that issue by putting a third party in the middle. Oh. And you can only talk to me and then I'll, I'll turn, that'll help, won't it? Yeah. Well, <laughs> when we do that a third time and a fourth time and then a fifth time, we create a management chain. <laughs> right? So all these misconnect, misconnects occur. Um, change resistance. What about that? Totally different brain than that one. Does this person think that person's resistant to change? Sure. And vice versa? Oh, yeah. Because they've already accepted. They've had insights about some things. Geez, we ought to have a, we ought to have a meeting this morning, whereas this person has not. So fasc I mean, this is, so, it's, uh, this is obvious, but it just it fascinates me, doesn't it? You know, the... Um, and you guys have been talking about the gloriousness of it all. How do we make it, how do we do the best of it and build on, on the greatness of humans? Um, but it is a, a, it can be a problem in, in self-awareness and all this stuff. So thank you guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> all right, what we're going to do now, I'm going to um, move to the bear, some of the barriers, and I'm going to cover this very quickly. Uh, we'll spend about five or six minutes. Uh, two of the biggest that I've discovered running around are the culture and the management chain itself, which we just touched on. Um, and on an individual basis, it's self-awareness and habit. And a lot of good work being done on habit. 
Um, when, I, when I work with the DOD executives, uh, we'd go over these simple behaviors and figure out, okay, how can executives use those four plus one behaviors? Uh, what I did was that I went out and did interviews to find out uh, a month later how many of them were applying those behaviors. What percent do you think? 10% one class, 15% for another class. How hard is this? So we're trying to do checklists and so forth. Um, what I heard here is, the, is a big part of the answer, which is um, reinforcing leadership, getting people together, talking about this stuff, living the values. Um, in your terms, it might be support groups. In my terms, it's, it's called reinforcing the, you know, the management chain and talking about talking about these things, um, fascinating area. Now let me show you a real quick um, model of an organization. Uh, very simple one, I like it better than McKinsey 7S uh, because it's only got four boxes in it. This is uh, Michael Tushman came up with this. I got a chance to work with him for a week on this one time. And all it is is, is how simple is this? People, formal organization, culture, and critical tasks of the organization. This fits your church or synagogue, this fits Promega, this fits Department of Education, this fits any organization. It's about that simple. And then you got inputs, history of the organization, all kinds of inputs coming in, and then whatever it is you do to get performance. Um, so which one do executives, new executives, always gravitate to? Which of those? Which one? Critical task and formal, and formal organization. Isn't that interesting? And I'm working on a book, uh, been working with a lot of psychologists on why is this? Why do they do that? Why do they gravitate to reorganization when it's generally a culture issue? They want to be more agile, they want to be more innovative, they want to be more collaborative. So what does moving the boxes around have to do with that? Anytime you break reporting lines, uh, you're getting back to the social pain problem, mm -hmm. creating creating more and more difficulties. Uh, what I love is I see people here working on this and this to where the power is. Executives will generally default to this. Agree? Anybody? All right. Um, now I've got your, it's embarrassing, but I've got your organization chart I want to show you next. and. Um, because it's a little awkward, but recognize that? <laughs> so let's go. What are, these are the what? Chickens? What are these? Yep. The trick question, what are these things? Weasels. Yeah, weasels, weasels, and then you got, of course, the, the lion. So what could go wrong in that organization? <laughs> Um, it gets to be really fascinating. I've worked with executives and I've had this one chart up for two days. Because it's a safe place to talk. It's not your organization chart. But you can go and go and go. Um, countless things get in the way and hurt you with this. This is one of the great, I think, one of the greatest ten inventions in the history of the world. Came out of Sumer about 5,000 years ago. Uh, that's Janus talking this way, uh, and I, I would say that this is probably one of the most hideous things ever designed to house people in, um, the, the management chain. So it's, got, it's good and evil, and when, I, when, I, when we talk about this, I'm not saying go to a networked organization. I'm not looking at struct, because networks can have the same problems that management chains do, right? Uh, for example, if you've got a severely bad boss, remember we talked about 25% of them? let's say are bad in an average organization. Um, corporate executive board in DC did a study about five years ago where they looked at severely bad bosses uh, that a unit is degraded for five years after that bad boss leaves. So think about if you've got rapid turnover like uh, every two years. Uh, this one has dampened this and caused a microculture per Shine, MIT and all that, moves here, does the same thing here, and this one's done it here and he's moves there. So your whole, as you move them around, you, you get yourself into a lot of trouble. Emotional memory. Yeah. 
There you go. There you go. Um, and I'm not throwing out, uh, just throwing out barriers to depress all you guys, but this is what we really got to think about is why, how, why do we not get to the promised land sometime? And culture can hold us back or help us. Uh, and then the management chain, uh, this is why I was walking with a, uh, remember I mentioned the DDO saying why the levers don't work? And, and that's, the, that's the reason. I mean, there's all kinds of, all kinds of issues, two-way disconnects. Telephone game, everywhere I go, every country I go, I ask executives, is there, do you, do you have a telephone game? Remember the kids? Everybody does. It's universal. The reason is that's the human brain. It's not kids whispering and messing things up. It's the way I receive information from you, spread it all over my brain, pull it back. I filtered it. Now I tell somebody else, gets discombobulated as it goes down. Uh, this is a big one. You guys, uh, like Promega has this. Uh, most organizations never, management chain never gets together and talks about what is our leadership philosophy here. And everybody's assuming everybody else is a theory Xer or a theory Yer or you know, enlightened leadership or servant leadership, but they don't even talk about that. So that can be a phenomenal issue, big issue. All right, let's go to another problem. Um, on the individual basis, we talked about self-awareness, but let's talk about habit. So what, what can you do to break a habit? Anybody got any, any reactions to that? Pick up a new one. Up a new one replace it. You, you really got to have that framework thing. I was delighted to hear that. Um, be aware of it. And here we come right back to consciousness and all of this and this is the best I can do in, in reading stuff I'm gonna just let you guys read that um, it's not it's not very satisfying to me because it's so hard to break habit go ahead and read that Uh, this one that came out within the last year, uh, willpower studies, that there's some of them are under fire, but I sort of feel that's right, that you've you got more going for you in the morning. This came out last month in uh, Stanford, uh, and, and we know this, but motivation seems to come in waves, so seize it when, when you feel a high wave. Uh, yeah. big. Yeah, it's fi I'm always fascinated by writing as opposed to typing. Uh, when, I, when I work with uh, executives or any groups, I make them fill in that sheet that you've got, a little blue sheet, and that raises the odds supposedly about 40% that they're actually going to do that, that they write. And if I could get them, and I do, to talk to somebody else, certify they'll do one, then I've, I'm really getting them up there to pull that off. Yes? No, but what, when you say that, oh, I see, you mean on habit and so forth. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, when you look at dieting, God forbid, uh, <laughs> that is extraordinarily hard to do. And um, you know, I've wrestled, wrestled with that for 20 years. Uh, and. And it's kind of, for me, it's what you just described. That's interesting. Where I have to keep it running in my software background and then bring it to conscious. You can Google self-deception, too, and see what's working there. Interesting. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love it. Um, well, I've got, um, this is a good place, any, to open it up for questions. And then I'm going to save uh, a few minutes at the end. I want to tell you a story about my best boss. I just want to close close with that. Somebody had a phenomenal impact on me. Uh, but before I open it up, um, I want to give you guys a gift because um, I have learned so much from you in the breaks and discussions. Um, it's really, wow, what a, what a cosmic fireworks that have been going on in my head. 
uh, and I really, really appreciate it. And I know, um, how many of you are, took chemistry in high school? Oh, good, great. So what I've got for you is the periodic table <laughs> of the elements of leadership and management. It took me four months of weekends to come up with this. This is what I gave my Leadership Academy graduates because we didn't have budget for gifts, so I, I had to come through, put this, put this thing together. Um, when you get it, uh, you'll never have to attend another leadership lecture class again because <laughs> it's all here. Uh, and the way you look at it is this half are leadership elements and this half are the management elements, giving, getting things done. You'll see three families like the real chart. See those colors? You got the how do you inspire people, how do you improve things, and then how do you implement or execute a mission. When you get it, it's vastly confusing. Go down to the bottom black boxes, which are group names, look at those, and then read up to see what elements are, are there. So they're passing those out now. I'm going to give you guys like a minute and a half to scan this thing. Uh, we'll have uh, a couple of questions, and I've got to tell you my my goodbye story about my best boss. I went to, I tried to go to liberatingstructures.org, it's .com, which is so... Oh, is clear. it .com? Yeah. I, it didn't come up when I did .org. Thank this you. Is. Bless you for that. take this one with me. <laughs> it's a work of art. we doing? Okay. Let me pull you guys back and take a couple of quick questions and then I'll, I'll give you my last story. Yes. that I think has been an important part of Promega's fourth space, as we've imagined it, is how do you move from professionalism to authenticity? Because you can have all kinds of creations like this, all kinds of leadership projects, all kinds of management teams, and things that you're teaching people, but people could be simply using them because they feel they need to, they're supposed to, the boss wants it, it's how you get ahead in an organization. Things don't fundamentally change culturally, from my perspective, until you move from that professionalism to authenticity. And the question is, how do you do it? How do you change a habit, not by a set of prescriptions, but by first asking, what is the positive intention of that habit for me? Ha and to answer your question on authenticity, think about that those four behaviors I talked about, uh, what do you think professional spy recruiters use to recruit somebody in a foreign country to give them secrets? <coughs> All of that stuff. Trust building. Uh, here's, a, here's a book. 
Um, let me know what you think of it. You know, here's a little gift. I mean, you get all that stuff. So that's not authentic, <clears throat> but the human brain sometimes can be taken in by that. Sometimes, most of the times not though. I think we, most of us spot people who are not authentic uh, with a lot of precision. And I've had, had people I work with uh, in, the, in the executives and supervisors both, uh, really some of them wrestle with this. They said, look, um, and, and now I've got to go out and say hello to everybody in the office and that's not me. Um, that's not being authentic. Won't they spot that? I, I would contend uh, all habit is small bites. So if you are trying to improve yourself one small step at a time, I don't think you're being inauthentic. So if you take, uh, you know, take one of those behaviors and you really work at it until it does become more ingrained and become habit, I think you're, I, I don't know if it's not an ethical issue, but I think you're on firmer ground. What do you? What I'm wondering is it, it almost feels to me that it's the movement to self-awareness through mindfulness or other depth psychology or however that brings you to the capacity to authenticity. Authenticity isn't something you're going to build one habit at a time. It's something about knowing yourself, knowing the nature of reality. I talk about radical self-acceptance, radical trust, what your vision of the world is, all of that. And I think, I think you're right, uh, and that's why I have self-awareness up there as one of those major blocks to the individual. And um, there are a lot of things that tricks our brain pulls on us so that we're not quite there. Very painful journey, as you know. <clears throat> What's the oldest saying in leadership? First thing that in writing we ever saw, know thyself. Know thyself, so. All right, one more? I've gotta tell my story though. Well, okay. let's do that. All right, let's do, I wanna tell my story. This was uh, my best boss, and I think number 117 on your chart is, uh, I think, is the Baldridge Award. Big deal for uh, in the corporate world. Um, I used to work for that man named Mac Baldridge. He was uh, uh, been a very successful CEO, uh, top 50 CEO. <clears throat> he was uh, under Reagan, came in, headed up the Commerce Department, uh, deeply loved at the Department of Commerce. He would walk in uh, to the cafeteria and employees, of course, scatter uh, like little minnows in front of a shark when a secretary comes in, right? He would grab them and say, come on, let's have lunch together and sit down with about eight of them and just talk, and chat them up. How are you doing? What do you, uh, what do you like about working here? Um, what about your family? How are they doing? He would just, just chit chat. Um, how many people do you think those eight people went out and told that they had lunch with the Secretary of Commerce that day? That's a nuclear explosion, right? Um, he would always ask one question at the end. He would say, hey, if you were me, what one thing would you do? A clever way to get some, he's not digging under his management chain, he's, but he's getting real feedback uh, by asking questions like that. Um, I was involved in a project um, that another guy, uh, Frank, disagreed with. So Frank came to me and said, Mike, um, you know I don't agree with this. I said, yeah, and he said, uh, but I want you to know I'm gonna go to talk to Baldridge and recommend he stop it, um, uh, but I wanted to give you a heads up. So what do you think about Frank? Huh? Straight shooter. He did not stab me in the back. I always respected him for that. He's today one of my best friends. My wife and I uh, had dinner with him before we came out here. Um, uh, so so he, did go to, he did go to Baldridge. So I get a, a call Friday afternoon, come up to Mac Baldridge's office. Um, and I'd forgotten that he is also, was also a rodeo uh, rider. One of the three best in the world, in fact. And on Fridays, he would cut out of work early around four o'clock and go ride horses. Uh, so when I walked in, I wasn't ready for it, he had jeans on. So here's the Secretary of Commerce wearing jeans, and he's got a red bandana hanging out the back of his pocket. And he says, come on, Mike, sit down and let's talk. So we sat and we chatted. 
Um, and I covered this in about four minutes, answered questions. Uh, and he said, Mike, this is fine. Uh, don't worry about Frank. I'll take care of that. Uh, so he's giving me top cover. Remember that gift? He, put it, he, he gave me top cover with Frank. He's going to go back to Frank, make sure Frank is OK. Um, so I get up to go. And he said, no, Mike, sit down. Let's talk. And the next 55 minutes was the best conversation in my life. We talked about his family, my family. We talked about our hobbies. We talked about the future of the Commerce Department. We got off on history a little bit. Absolutely remarkable. So what other gifts was he giving me? Time. These guys operate in 15 minute increments. He gave me an hour. I will, I will trust that man forever. Just sealed it, sealed my. And so later, uh, I was living in the old Soviet Union, and I got a call from the US Embassy uh, to report there right away. So I, I go into the embassy, and they handed me a cable. And the cable said, we regret to inform you that Mac Baldrige uh, was killed today in a rodeo accident. And uh, it was totally fluke. A horse rolled over. The pommel on the saddle hit his belt buckle. He had internal injuries and died. Uh, and that was the day the Commerce Department cried. I've never seen impact uh, of a leader like that. Um, and that would really be the end of the story, except my wife, Pat, knows how I feel about Mac Baldridge. And she works in a trade association downtown. She came home a couple years ago and said, Mike, Mike, you're not going to believe this. And I said, what? And she said, we had 10 people in from the Commerce Department today. And I said, yeah. And she said, 25 years later, they're still talking about Mac Baldrige. And that's a legacy. It's a leadership legacy. And that's what I wish for each of you guys. Make a difference in other people's lives, whether you're in the leadership position or not, doesn't matter, so that you're remembered years and years from now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.